Hello my dear students and welcome back to Excellence Batch and I am your Diksha ma'am. So here we have started the chapter Biotechnology Principle and, and Processes. So, so far in this chapter we have discussed how the gene cloning is done and what are the various tools of recombinant DNA technology. Today we are going to talk about how actually in laboratory all this gene cloning is done. So far we have just discussed the theoretical part, it's time to discuss the practical part. So it's just like you're working in an industry. Let's get started. So these are all the steps of the various processes that takes place whenever you are going to make product out of a some recombinant DNA by using recombinant DNA technology. So the first step is isolation of the genetic material. That means whatever genetic material you're using, whether of a vector or your foreign DNA, that need to be isolated. Then you will cut it, which is cutting of DNA at specific location. Then you will separate the desired gene out of that big DNA and then you will multiply it. Then you will join it with the vector. Then you will insert into the host and then you will multiply it and obtain your foreign product. And the last is downstream processing. Now these all may be looking a little weird and difficult for you, but let's get started with them and we'll discuss them in detail. It's all about uh, these topics only, right? So the first is isolation of the genetic material that is DNA. All right. So isolation of the genetic material that's DNA. Then how can you take out the DNA? So to take out the DNA, there are various steps. For example, first of all, what we do, we take the cell culture, whatever cells are multiplying. For example, we are multiplying human cells. Okay. So, it's, for example, there are beta cells of human inside this flask. Then you will centrifuge it. Right. After centrifugation, you will see that a pallet of cell is obtained. A pallet of cell is obtained. As you all know, the DNA is present inside the cell, so you need to take the DNA out. So how can you, you know, uh, how can you take the DNA out? First of all, you have to break the outer wall of the cell. You got it. For example, if I say this is a cell, if I want to take this uh, DNA out from this nucleus, I have to break this entire wall. Fine. How can I break it? I can break it with the addition of enzymes. I will add enzyme. As a result, my DNA, my DNA will get out from the particular cell and the DNA gets separated. Again, the DNA is not completely visible. DNA is dissolved in this solution. Okay, there is a solution present here. DNA is still dissolved in the solution. I can't visualize it. Then what I will do? I will add chilled ethanol. I will add chilled ethanol and whenever I, I add the chilled ethanol, you can see uh, this, this was how it was earlier and when I added the chilled ethanol, these strands of DNA, they came out. The strands of DNA, they came out and this process, when you add chilled ethanol, you precipitate the DNA and DNA come out in the form of strands. You call this process as spooling. What is spooling? In spooling, the DNA is precipitated and taken out in the, in the form of threads. In the form of threads. And how, how it is possible? When you add the chilled ethanol. Now the question is, what enzymes are added to break the cell wall? So these cells can be of various type. For example, it can be an animal cell like your beta cell. It can be a plant cell because on depending upon what cells culture you are doing and what experiment are you doing, these cells which you are growing, they can be a different type. Imagine you want to take the DNA that is plasmid which is a vector out of the bacteria. Then what will be the culture here? The culture will be the bacterial culture. This can be a fungus also. This can be a fungus also. So for various types of organisms, for various type of organism and for various type of cell, you add different type of enzyme. 
For example, the animal cell wall is made up of normal cell membrane. How to break that cell membrane? For that you can use the enzyme lipase. If it is a plant cell, plant cell wall is made up of cellulose. Then you have to add the enzyme cellulase. If it is bacteria, then we will be adding lysozyme. If it is fungus, fungus cell wall is made up of chitin, then I will be adding chitinase. So all these various types of enzymes are used according to the cell culture that you are doing. Now this was to disturb the cell membrane. Okay, now what about RNAs and proteins present? You also want to destroy them so that only DNA is precipitated out. Along with that, we also add some RNAs enzyme which will digest the RNA and some proteases which will digest the protein which will digest the protein. So they will digest the protein and they will digest RNA. Alright, so that the only thing that comes out is your DNA, nothing else. Alright, okay, I am having little flu, so I am so sorry if I am doing again and again. <laughs> okay, alright, so this was the first step. So by this step you have taken the actual DNA out from a cell. For example, you want a gene that produces insulin hormone in human then what will you do you will take the animal cell break it take the dna out now the dna has been taken out now this dna is both of a vector and of a desired gene now from that big dna i want my foreign dna which is my insulin secreting gene to come out how can i do that that leads to the next step that is cutting of DNA at specific location also known as fragmentation of the DNA. The DNA that we have taken out is a complete DNA of the animal or a human being. Now I want to cut my DNA so that I can get a particular piece which I require. So how can I cut it? I will treat it with restriction enzyme. So how the fragmentation of DNA is done? Restriction enzymes are used here. Restriction endonucleases are used to cut the DNA. Alright, by that your number of pieces are formed. Pieces of DNA are formed. If you don't understand, let me explain you in more detail. For example, this is your entire genome's DNA. This is your entire genome's DNA. You added a restriction enzyme and that restriction enzyme cuts at places. Okay. That restriction enzyme cuts at places. Now the entire DNA has been converted into small pieces of various lengths of DNA. Okay. Now out of this, now out of this, imagine this is the piece of DNA that you required, that is your foreign DNA. This is a gene that secretes insulin. Now how will you isolate this? That's the next step. So the next step after cutting it is how will you separate and isolate the gene of interest. What is the gene of interest? The gene of interest is this one that you want to take it out. Okay. Now how will you isolate and separate? For separation, we have a technique known as gel electrophoresis and for isolation, we have a technique known as elution. So these two techniques are required to take out your desired DNA or gene of interest from the different or number of pieces of DNA. So we'll first talk about separation that is gel electrophoresis. First, we'll talk about gel electrophoresis. Let's start it on a fresh page. Gel electrophoresis. So, by its name, by its name, you will get a lot of things. You will get to know about a lot of things about this process. First of all, it is electrophoresis. That means electric field and charge, they are involved. Gel, some gel is involved. Some gel is involved. Okay. So the gel that is involved in this one is taken from a seaweed. From seaweed, 
a red algae and the name of the gel is agarose gel agarose gel so agarose gel is a gel just like a jelly you eat na just like jelly you eat just like that agarose gel is used in this particular experiment now how this experiment is done what do we do first of all i'll be talking about much about you know experimental things so that you can clarify everything from it okay what we do we have a plate we have a plate like this of plastic okay in this plate we add a solution and what is that solution we have this seaweed in a powder form and we add that in a hot water we stir it and then immediately we put it into this plate and then that will become solidify and become agarose gel this is how a jelly is formed if you have ever seen any uh, youtube video of how the jelly is formed at home this is how it is a powder is there you mix the powder with the hot water stir it and put it somewhere and then it will solidify and becomes a gel okay so this is how make, we make the agarose gel so when the agarose gel is solidifying we put something so that some gaps are formed here we put a comb like structure so that small empty spaces are formed here this is how we uh, you know prepare the gel for this experiment all right now another thing these small spaces that has been formed they are known as wells for dna sample so we add our dna sample here we add our dna sample here in the first row is present a ladder and that ladder tells us about the molecular weight or the length of the dna just like if when you have a scale how do you measure your height because you have a scale by that scale you have the measurement like 1 2 3 4 5 6 just like that we have a ladder here and this ladder can tell us about the molecular weight of your dna okay uh, molecular weight of dna is usually we uh, you know we calculate in the form of number of nucleotides it have number of nucleotide it has right or the size of the dna to be very precise so what we do we add sample of dna here add dna here right now what dna we are ad adding here this one the one which have a lot of pieces of dna after fragmentation now this dna will add in that sample okay and this has been this has been attached with the electric field it has a current at this side anode is present anode is positively charged at this side cathode is present which is negatively charged and you also know the dna they are also negatively charged now we will switch on this when we will switch on this the dna because it is negatively charged it will move towards the positively charged anode it will move towards the positively charged anode so the piece that is very small it can run very fast and will reach at first towards the anode okay let me tell you one more thing the agarose gel if you will zoom it and see its molecular structure inside the agarose gel are present these pores inside the agarose gel are present these pores so when dna is running towards the anode because it's negatively charged it will move towards the positively charged anode when dna is running towards the anode the dna has to run very fast because it is getting attracted so it has to pass through these pores so any size of dna which is smaller can easily pass through the pores and the one which is larger will get stuck here so you will see that the larger fragments of dna will be present here whereas smaller fragments will be present here right so here you will see the larger fragment and here you will see the smaller fragment why because smaller fragments can easily pass through the pores and will reach at first and this effect that how dna is passing through the pores and running fast is known as sieving effect what do you call it as sieving effect so we say how how the dna is running it is running running by sieving effect that means dna passes through the pores 
सीव मीन्स इन हिंदी वी सेट छननी बाय विच यू फिल्टर टी और कॉफी और यू नो योर मिल्क राइट दैट सीव दैट्स इन योर लाइक हाउस इन योर किचन्स सो हियर डी एन ए पास थ्रू द पोर्स सो दैट इफेक्ट इज अ सीविंग इफेक्ट एंड थ्रू सीविंग इफेक्ट द स्मॉलर मॉलिक्यूल्स आर रनिंग वेरी फास्ट इन पासिंग हेयर सो वी से दैट स्मॉलर द फ्रेगमेंट फार्दर इट विल मूव smaller the fragment farther it will move why 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 do we say that okay let me correct it farther it will move why do we say that because the smaller fragment can easily pass through the small pores and it can run very fast so now on the basis of molecular weight and number of nucleotide we know for example uh, that our dna which we need is 70 nucleotide long so we will take out the 70 nucleotide whatever here is and we will take it out and taking out that particular band is known as elution that is isolation okay okay we'll talk about that later now the question is that right now the gel is transparent and the dna solution was also transparent so you will not be able to identify the brands running here like that okay because the gel is transparent and dna solution is also transparent so it's very difficult very difficult to identify or see the bands how can you see the band so to visualize the band we have a dye to visualize the band ethidium bromide is used ethidium bromide is used all right so what we do for example this is your gel imagine this is the color of the gel all right and these are the dna bands can you see any dna bands here you cannot you cannot because the color is same so what we do we have a machine we put our gel on this one we put our gel on this one okay but we put the gel after dyeing we take this gel we add dye to it we add dye to it for example we have a box we have a box we dip that gel into that uh, box and that box is containing solution of ethidium bromide okay is just like uh, is just like for example i have this gel okay and there is a box with water when water have ethidium bromide i do like this okay and then i put it on a machine and this machine will pass uv light will pass uv light and when the uv light will pass through the gel the gel will show orange color bands which color band orange color band so whenever we want to visualize whenever we we want to visualize the bands ethidium bromide is used which is a dye dye and it gives orange color bands orange color band but it will only give orange orange color bands whenever exposed to uv light when exposed to uv light otherwise it will not show you the color it will only show you the color when the uv light is passed all right so that's about how we separate with the help of gel electrophoresis next thing is elution how will you isolate it elution is a process that we use for isolation what we do for example this is the gel and in this gel this is the band that we want to take it out then what we will do we will make a cut and take this out we'll make a cut and take this out now you will say ma'am gel will also come with it after we'll cut we'll take it out and add agarase agarase is the enzyme that will digest agarose and dna get separated and this is how you got your desirable dna out from the 
gel this is a very crucial step because it's very tough to take your desirable gene out of the dna okay so that's the first step of gene cloning the other steps are still there right and this is the most difficult step and it takes number of days to take the pure form of dna out all right so that's how we have isolated the desired dna dna next is amplification so how can we amplify a gene of interest so the gene of interest of foreign dna that we have taken out is very small in quantity but we want to make a lot of product out of it for example if that gene was insulin secreting gene right but we want to pack the insulin in bottles and want to market it and spread it to the people who are diabetic right so for that we need large quantity so how that small quantity of gene that one band of gene can produce large amount of uh, quantity of insulin it's impossible so we want to multiply it and that what is amplification and that what is amplification amplification means to multiply that gene and we can multiply with this machine and the name of this machine is thermal cycler and the technique that we use to multiply the gene is pcr PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, right? So for performing this experiment, we need to have this machine first, right? Apart from that, we will have to have a DNA template that we want to amplify. That we need to amplify okay like we have taken an example of uh, insulin secreting gene second because dna multiplication will take place so it will be just like dna replication but in vitro that means an outside condition so here we will be needing dna polymerase but this dna polymerase is not same as ours it's tac polymerase this is a DNA polymerase of a bacterium which is Thermus aquaticus. This has been extracted from Thermus aquaticus. It's a thermophilic bacteria. Thermo means heat, philic means lover. This bacteria can survive at around 95 degrees Celsius temperature. And in thermal cycler, during experiment, the temperature goes maximum up to 95 degrees Celsius. So we wanted such kind of DNA polymerase, which will not get denatured at high temperature. So we extracted the DNA polymerase from this bacterium because it can survive at 95 degrees Celsius. So tag polymerase can survive at high temperature if we will use our uh, dna polymerase it can survive up to around 40 degrees celsius and then it will denature it will get destroyed because this is enzyme and enzymes are made up of protein but because this bacteria lives in at high temperature condition in hot springs where it is present at hot springs so we they found out how this is surviving because it has a survivability so we extracted its uh, dna polymerase and used in this reaction another thing that we need here in raw material are some ions and last deoxy not last okay deoxyribonucleotides of adenine thymine cytosine and guanine so four type of deoxyribonucleotides are required which are like bricks when you want to make a wall you need bricks so this is what dna is made up of and fifth thing is your rna primer with free oh with free three prime oh group without primer you all know replication can never take place so it's just like dna replication but in vitro so it's technically in vitro dna multiplication or replication now how it is done let's understand this in more detail you got to know about the raw materials let's understand this imagine in that thermocycler i added my one dna strand that i want to multiply imagine this is the gene i want to multiply 
this is 5 prime end this is 3 prime end this is 3 prime end this is 5 prime end now i will denature this denaturation means when you break bonds and which bonds are present in between two strand hydrogen bond okay so denaturation because we want to make break the bonds this take place at high temperature or 95 degrees celsius high temperature of 95 degrees celsius once the denaturation takes place the both the strands will get separated all right so these two strands they get separated now that will lead to the next step that is annealing and for annealing the temperature of the machine will go down for around it will move uh, down and it will become 50 to 60 degrees celsius and now the rna primer will get added at these end this is 5 prime end this is 3 prime end or for rna primer 5 prime end 3 prime end what is rna primer this is nothing just small nucleotide sequence which have 3 prime oh group uh, free so you can see 3 prime group is free here okay now this will lead to the next step the next step leads to the dna replication when tag polymerase will come when tag polymerase will come and that will ask these rna primer to add the to add the deoxyribonucleotides to it and start replication in this direction so this is 5 prime end 3 prime end 5 prime end 3 prime end 5 prime end 3 prime end 3 prime 5 prime as you all know replication always takes place from 5 prime to 3 prime end so as a result here it is also taking around 5 prime to 3 prime 5 prime to 3 prime and that's the third step and the third step is known as extension and extension takes place at 72 degree celsius with the help of enzyme tac polymerase all right now you will find out that after this two strands of dna are formed two strands of dna are formed so you will see after around 30 cycle after around 30 cycles like this you can get around 1 billion time dna of the original so see just by one uh, machine you can multiply your dna as much as you want so this is how you can amplify the gene of interest imagine this dna was your gene of interest fine okay now what are the various application of pcr where do we use this technique because this is a boom in the micro uh, sorry in the biotechnology and it is used everywhere almost you must have heard of rt pcr test in covid so that's the pcr okay so the first application of pcr is as i've told you to detect the pathogen to detect the pathogen detection okay detection of pathogen so whenever we want to detect a pathogen we use this technique okay another for parental issues who is whose dad right or uh, this child is having this dad or that dad all the parental issues they are uh, basically done with this one okay dna fingerprinting whenever you have to find out who is the criminal you use this uh, technique of pcr dna fingerprinting also in fossils and you call there as paleontology paleontology is study of fossil whenever you got a fossil you have to identify its dna structure you take a small sample you multiply it and then you identify it okay so otherwise to find out the new species we can also do this uh, pcr to see any genetic disorders or mutations for example a baby is not born and you want to see if a baby is having any genetic disorder or not we can undergo this technique so see a lot of applications are there in almost every field of biology of pcr and without that biology is incomplete so these are the various uh, applications of pcr next step is ligation of dna fragment into the vector now as we have isolated as we have isolated our foreign dna 
this is how we have isolated our foreign dna we have also multiplied it we have number of them and on the other hand we also have isolated our vector we also have isolated our vector same way we also have digested it with the restriction enzyme now we have foreign dna and we have vector we want them to join together let's join them together how can they join with the help of enzyme dna ligase so how the ligation of a foreign dna in vector is done with the help of this enzyme known as dna ligase and then they will become a recombinant dna and then they will become a recombinant dna now you know the next step because you have done gene cloning after they have been ligated the next step here will be to get it into the host yes so the next step is that insertion of recombinant dna into the host cell or organism now how they will go inside the host cell so how can we insert our recombinant dna into our host let's see so the first technique by which we can add our recombinant dna into the host is a process known as transformation the transformation is the process by which the recombinant dna enter into the host organism okay so what's the definition of it it's a process by which recombinant dna enter into host enter into host all right now for example if this is a bacteria this bacteria wants to have this recombinant dna inside of it but the bacteria does not know anything about it so we want to make this bacteria ready and that is known as to make the host competent so how can we make this bacteria ready or competent we will first treat this with calcium ions we will treat this with calcium ion so we are treating it with calcium ion so that this bacteria become a competent host competent host is a host that is ready to take up the that is ready to take up the dna all right once you have added uh, this calcium ion we also add calcium chloride ion sometimes we also make calcium chloride ions uh, sorry calcium chloride sometime by this calcium chloride what happen this recombinant dna gets precipitated here precipitation of the dna which dna our dna r means recombinant dna okay now what we will do we will give heat shock and heat shock is given at 42 degree celsius when we will give heat shock the pores of the bacteria will get open the pores of the bacteria will get open okay so making competent and giving heat shock say serves the same purpose they make the host competent by which the host will open up its pores so once the pores are open imagine this pore is open okay so by this pore the recombinant dna will enter inside your host and this is how it will become a part of it this is how it will become a part of it this everything is stored in the ice conditions or in a ice cool condition so what we do after we have given the uh, heat shock we put it back in ice why are we doing so first reason when we will put that back into the ice the pores will close and second whenever you have to preserve anything you put that in ice all right so this is the first technique by which by using ions and giving heat shock condition you open the pores and put the dna inside of the bacteria this is first technique the second technique that we can use is micro injection so we technically are giving injection to the animal cell so the cell that we use here is always the animal cell the same technique has been used in icsi intracytoplasmic sperm injection in 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 vitro fertilization in assisted reproductive technology in chapter reproductive health so what we do we take a micro needle and we give injection of a dna we give injection of a dna right so this is one another technique where a micro needle or injections are used to add the recombinant dna directly into the host cell nucleus 
and this technique is done for which cells exclusively for animal cells so this is a nucleus so what are we doing we are doing nothing we are just giving injection of a recombinant dna directly into the nucleus of the animal cell so this is done when animal cells are host this is done transformation when your bacteria is the host which is host when bacteria is the host all right now let's talk about plants what about plants for plants we have two techniques for plants two techniques can be used one is agrobacterium humifacients you remember this bacteria we have done this in the previous class agro agrobacterium humifacients is a bacterium which contains ti plasmid because ti plasmid have a habit to get transferred into another cell which is a plant cell so that is a common habit of bacteria and we are using it for transformation second thing is your gene gun also known as biolistics biolistics or gene gun now what is this for example this is a plant cell this is a nucleus of a plant cell okay let me label the things also to make it more clarify imagine this is a plant cell and we want that dna should en enter inside the plant cell you can't go for micro injection because the cell wall of bacteria is thick right so what we use we use a gun okay and the name of the gun is gene gun just like any other gun it also have a trigger it also have a trigger okay so in this gun we have gold or tungsten particles which are coated with the dna just like a gun have a bullet right and we have a trigger when we press the trigger the bullet will run and go inside a person's body or somewhere you are you are aiming right just like that here your bullets are these what are these these are gold or tungsten particles coated with dna so just like what we do the bullet is present inside the gun okay so if you will strike the bullet like this the person will never die why the person die because when you pull the trigger at that time the bullet run at high velocity same thing we are doing here at high velocity we are bombarding these particles and these particles will go inside your nucleus and they will become a part of it the gold or tungsten can be taken out can be recovered from the plant cell later on the dna will become the part of the plant cell another thing why we are using gold and tungsten because they are inert they are inert particle so what basically we do in the gene gun the high velocity particles containing dna are bombarded are bombarded in plant cell okay so these are the various technique by which we can uh, add our recombinant dna to host cell one more technique that we have is electroporation so what we do here whenever we will give electric current for example this is a host cell okay this is a host cell in transformation what we were doing when we give heat shock the pores open just like that if we give the electric current then that also pores will open so in electroporation electric field is used to open pore electric field is used to open pores okay so for example the pore opens when it will open when you will give the electric field or electric current and when the pore will open what will happen the dna from the pore will enter inside the host cell okay so any of the uh, these techniques can be used for transforming the cell or entering the recombinant dna into the host the only difference is that um, it varies according to the need and the type of the cell okay for example if the cell is a plant cell then you will go for biolistics or agrobacterium if it is animal cell definitely you will use you will use 
that micro injection technique all right if it is bacteria we will go for transformation all right so let's read this paragraph of ncrt now once the recombinant dna has been added into the host we also need to check out whether the host has uh, taken the dna or not for that we will use the insertional inactivation technique using selectable marker we can also find out that which is transformant and which is non transformant so let's read this paragraph and the things will become more clearer there are several methods of introducing the ligated dna into recipient cell right recipient cells after making them competent to receive take up dna part present in its surrounding so what recipient cells what right? recipient cells after making them competent to receive take up the dna present in the surrounding once you have made the recipient cell that is host cell as a competent competent means ready to receive then they will take whatsoever dna is present around them so if a recombinant dna bearing gene for resistance to an antibiotic is transferred into e coli cell the host cell become transformed into ampicillin resistant cell so the same thing if that dna is containing ampicillin resistant gene then the entire dna entire e coli or the bacteria will become antibiotic resistant for example if you don't understand cell imagine this was a bacteria we added this recombinant dna here okay so imagine this recombinant dna had ampicillin resistant gene once the dna has entered here now i will feed this bacteria with ampicillin then this bacteria will survive then we will make sure if it is surviving that means the gene has been added and now this has been transformed okay so these are known as selectable markers that we have already discussed if we spread the transformed cell on uh, agar plate containing ampicillin only transformants will grow untransformed recipients will die all right so transformant will grow because they have the ampicillin resistant gene and they are resistant to ampicillin but the others they will die since due to ampicillin resistant gene one is able to select a transformed cell in the presence of ampicillin so with the help of this antibiotic and antibiotic resistant gene you can identify which is transformant and which is not the ampicillin resistant gene in case of this is a selectable marker i hope that is pretty clear to everyone next is once you have added this into the host now it's time to multiply the host and take the product whatever product it is producing okay imagine that recombinant dna also contain the insulin secreting gene now it's time that the host organism should multiply a lot the host organism should multiply a lot and secrete the product all right let's see let's read these lines with me first obtaining the foreign gene product after having cloned the gene of interest and having optimized the condition to induce the expression of the target protein one has to consider producing it on a large scale now whatever we have done we have transformed the bacteria but they are again few in number but we want the pro uh, the production at large scale okay we will grow them more can you think of any reason why there is a need for large scale production okay so this is a question uh, that is asked in ncrt why are we producing it in large scale the reason is because we want marketing because we want that product should reach to every person okay then if any protein encoding gene is expressed in a heterologous host it is a recombinant protein all right for example this is bacteria and bacteria is a prokaryote but the gene that we are adding is a eukaryotic gene imagine this is the insulin gene and insulin gene has been extracted from us that means we are eukaryote so both are different so the host now is not a homologous host it's a heterologous host it's a heterologous host what is a heterologous host the host which is different from the recombinant dna that has been added all right so now whatever protein this host will be forming the protein now will be known as a recombinant protein the cells harboring clone gene of interest may be grown on a small scale in laboratory the cultures may be used for extracting the desired protein and then purifying it by using different separation technique now what we do after we have seen that the dna has been entered into the host by selectable marker we directly don't go to the large scale first we perform the experiment in laboratory and we multiply our bacterias if we got to know 
the bacteria are multiplying and they are producing a gene of uh, they are producing a protein desired protein then we will take up this to the large scale because now we are sure that bacteria are working and they are producing protein now let's take up into the large scale and how can we do it to the large scale let's see so if we want to do something at large scale we need some large vessels in which we can do the thing just like when we cook food at home we cook it in the small vessels right small utensils but when the food is cooked for like thousands people right thousand of people then it is usually cooked in the large utensils and large vessel just like that because here the production is going to be at large scale so we need some uh, large vessels known as bioreactors so these bioreactors they are also known as fermenters these are cylindrical in shape usually and have a capacity of around 1000 liters 1000 liters and they are usually modified in a way that uh, they contain all the good conditions which are required to form your product for example i want a bioreactor to produce alcohol or i need a bioreactor to form insulin by the growth of e coli bacteria then i will purchase a bioreactor which is appropriate for the growth of e coli right so for example they will have agitator system agitator means the stirring system by which the substances they can be stirred okay they have stirrers as i've told you for stirring they have ph control system by which the ph of the solution can be controlled they also have temperature and pressure control system by which you can also control the temperature pressure because you all know every cell every microorganism needed an appropriate condition to grow okay apart from that they also have oxygen delivery system by which you can uh, deliver the oxygen from a port so that the bacteria if they need oxygen for the growth they keep on getting the oxygen apart from that they also have forming form breaker system if during this process the solution breaks a lot of form we don't want that because that will take a lot of space in the bioreactor then that form can also get break so such kind of systems are present in these large vessel and in them we produce large quantity of our products okay let's see how are these so there are two basic types of uh, bioreactor and both are stirred type stirred means there will be something that will help in stirring the components there will be something in that that will help in the stirring for example you can see this is the thing which helps in stirring this is a thing that helps in stirring stirring means to mix something okay apart from that we also have a form breaker that will break the form flat bladed impeller that will rotate at a faster rate to mix the things then what is present inside that is a culture broth what is a culture broth the solution in which you keep your bacteria so that they can grow then we also have a port where we add the steam for sterilization we will make sure no extra bad fungus or microbes will grow and only our product will be formed so for that we will keep on sterilizing them by time to time and then they also have acid base or ph system and here it is for pressure you can see the base is a little curved this one which is the first bioreactor it has a curved base and the name of this bioreactor is simple stirred tank bioreactor simple stirred tank bioreactor have a curved base so that the things can mix easily if the base would have been not curved if it would have been flat then it will be very difficult for things to get mixed they rather get accumulated here okay then we have the another one spart stirred tank and sparge stir tank have a very special thing this is sparger though it have the stirrer which will stir the things but it has a special thing that is sparger what is a sparger sparger is a big plate and this plate have small holes so whenever this sparger will move in this direction it will from this the culture will pass and small bubbles will be formed 
basically this is present there to form small bubbles and break the big bubbles okay because if you have big bubbles like this then the space left for oxygen in the culture broth will be very less for example if you have a destinated space of this much then you can see in this only small amount of oxygen can get trapped but if i have same space if i have same space and i have small bubbles then the space for oxygen will be more so the function of this parger is to make small bubbles you can read it here increase surface area for oxygen transfer bubbles uh, dramatically increase the oxygen transfer area so the function of this parger is sparger will make small bubbles will make small bubbles so that you can have more surface area for oxygen because big, big bubbles will give you small surface area for the oxygen but we want more surface area for the oxygen so this is how small bubbles are the better option now you can see how much oxygen can move all right so these type of tanks are used so what type of industry you are in what type of product you want to make you can buy many type of bioreactor so market is flooded with them okay all right so this is how we produce the product so now when we are making the product we want to make cultures okay for example if this is e coli and e coli contains my insulin secreting gene then the culture for that bacteria will be different if i sorry if i am growing some other microbe the culture for that will be different okay so just like that we also have different kinds of culture one such kind of a culture is a closed culture or batch culture all right another type of a culture is open culture or continuous culture and the third type of a culture is fed batch is fed batch culture so what happen in the closed culture closed culture is usually seen in alcohol fermentation what they do we take a they take a bioreactor put a fixed concentration of culture broth in it for example this bioreactor have the capacity of 1000 liter so they will add 1000 liter of the culture and then they will close it they will close it now after some days they will open it and take out the product from it and then they will wash the bioreactor then add the next batch so the production of the things is occurring in the batches after completion of uh, production of every batch the bioreactor is washed and get ready for the next batch this is what happened in the close so what happened in the close the quantity of culture remains fixed quantity remain fixed and it is used in batches because here you close the lid that's why it's a closed culture it's a closed culture so one batch then again second and then second the negative thing about this is that because you are not interrupting what is happening inside of it you are not adding anything you are not checking whether oxygen is there or not whether the nutrients are there or not so what will happen eventually after some time when the bacteria is multiplying after some time when the bacteria is multiplying its toxin will get accumulated toxin get accumulated and when the bacteria's toxin get accumulated the growth reduces the growth reduces okay second we have is a open or continuous culture open or continuous is better than this one because here we are not letting toxin get accumulated how let's see what we do at one side in continuous we are adding new culture and on the other hand we are taking out the product so when we are taking out the product the toxin will not accumulate here 
the toxin will not get accumulate here but the thing is that there is no fixed concentration no fixed quantity so the wastage of the culture is more here there is no fixed quantity but the thing is that toxin will not accumulate because after interval you are taking out the product from here so when you are taking out the product the toxin will also get removed along with that so toxin will not accumulate will not accumulate so by that the bacteria will always remain in a exponential phase that is a growth phase okay so bacteria in exponential phase all right but here they will go to lag phase after some time because uh, because the toxins are getting accumulated i think you understand that graph or of the bacterial growth that you do in botany now in fed batch fed batch is containing both the good things of the batch and the culture and new fed batch has been produced so what we do in a fed batch first of all what is a good thing of the batch the good thing is that it has fixed quantity of culture so nothing is wasted in this one what is good the bacteria is always in the exponential phase so what we do just like in continuous we add the product from one end and take it from the another end okay so at one end we will add culture and take out product from the other end so here bacteria will be present so because we are taking culture we are putting culture at one end and taking product from the another end we are at one benefit that bacteria are always in exponential phase bacteria in exponential phase but just like that of batch culture we also have fixed the quantity now here we were using it recklessly like we didn't know the fixed concentration but here we have done it for a fixed concentration okay so three type of culture are there and the most best one is the fed batch culture now the culture is done okay the product is formed inside your bioreactor now let's take the product out from the bioreactor because that vessel is containing a lot of things that vessel is containing culture broth that vessel is containing toxins that vessel is containing dead bacteria that vessel is also containing live bacteria and apart from that it is also containing your product okay imagine this is a bioreactor now in this bioreactor what do we have the first thing we have is culture broth in culture broth we also have toxin we also have dead bacteria we also have some live bacteria we also have other waste products and we also have our desired product for example insulin hormone now we want to take this desired product out what will we do we will go for separation techniques and the separation techniques involved many techniques first of all what we will do we will do the simple we'll start from the simple one we will take solid out liquid out okay we will do filtration we will do filtration we can also do centrifugation so that the product get settled down according to their sedimentation rate okay we can also go for distillation in which according to their melting point the boiling point according to the boiling points the products can be separated we can also go for chromatography this is another technique by which usually proteins are separated by which proteins are separated so all these separation techniques are done and the product is taken out product separated now once the product is separated what you do you do packaging of it you do packaging of it but before packaging right we add anything that we need like we add preservatives if it's a food material we add preservative or any other things then we will store it right 
now it will go to approvals it will go for approvals for example a lot of drugs they go for approvals before going to the markets once the approvals are done the quality check is done approval and quality check is done then it will go to the market so that people can get it so this is down this is how the entire process is done in your industry scale so these certain last steps are done for every product whether it's a food product if you have seen food factory in your, the discovery channel i guess there is a show you'll get to know that in a better form fine so this is how you can uh, separate the product package it store it and uh, check its quality and then market it all these steps they come under downstream processing gene expression producing the product all these things they come under upstream processing like we have like we have done all these things right like we have done all these steps all these steps from first to seven all these steps they are the part of upstream processing but separating the product packing it quality check everything is under the downstream processing all right so this is how you can produce any product in a, at a laboratory or at a large scale factory scale right and this is how they come to your house uh, and you use them and this is a boom because uh, many people who are suffering from a lot of diseases they get the therapeutics just by these techniques by these factories by these people you get vaccine by this technique you get insulin by these get uh, the, these technique you get hormones by this technique you get interferon injection you got antibodies injection by these techniques right so that's why they are very important and uh, if you want to have your career in this go for it this is a very nice field of biotechnology you can go for pharmaceuticals you can go for production of drugs you can go for vaccination production and everything so that's about the first chapter in the next chapter we will see about where these techniques are applied a lot and you will get more insight of it so that stay tuned to our channel and uh, we'll meet in the next class bye bye take care